to kind of go back to my roots of personality psychology. And as David mentioned, what I'm going to be talking about today is a little bit not my core research on personality itself, but kind of a meta talk about how to assess the quality of personality research and psychological research more generally. So I'm looking forward to getting your feedback on this. This is kind of a new direction for my work. And a lot of these are ideas that I'm still working through. Um, so it'll be great to, to hear your thoughts. Um, so I wanna first start by acknowledging my collaborators and graduate students who have spoken with a lot about these ideas. So what I'm presenting today is really our shared work and, and ideas that we've discussed together and the works that I've been, I'll be talking about has fun, been funded by the US Defense Department, DARPA, and the Templeton Foundation. Um, so I'll give you a little bit of a kind of big picture view of what I'm gonna talk about today. So I'm gonna talk about what makes a research paper good or what makes research good, focusing on personality research in particular, but I think a lot of what I'll say applies to some other areas as well. And then talk about how do we evaluate quality? How do we assess the quality of a research paper? And how do we communicate that evaluation to people who would benefit from knowing what the evaluation is? And I'm gonna talk about this um, partly because I, I'm interested inherently, you know, I teach research methods, I'm interested in what we teach versus what we practice about what makes high quality research, which may, what makes good research, and also what I see as some failures in how we communicate about the strengths and weaknesses of papers, that we put stuff out there and there's very, very little information about what the experts, the peer reviewers, the community thinks about the strengths and weaknesses of papers, and I think we can do a lot better. Um, and to give you kind of the punchline of what I'm gonna argue is that if we want people to evaluate research on its own merits, rather than using heuristics like journal prestige or things like that, then we need to give people easy to digest information about what's good and what's not so good about the research. And so we need to develop measures and ways to communicate those measures. So today I'll talk about uh, what I, why I think peer review isn't a good enough way to do this, what's wrong with peer review, and then kind of take a step back and ask, okay, so what makes the paper good? What should we be assessing when we're evaluating the quality of a research paper in personality psychology? And then I'll present a few preliminary studies where we tried to evaluate the quality of personality research and some social psych research. And I'll warn you now that I don't have a lot of results. So a few of these studies we've finished, and but most of them, the big ones, are really still in progress and I don't have results. So a lot of this is to show you kind of how, how we're tackling this problem and, and hear your thoughts on that. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about my vision for what the future of research evaluation could look like. So let's start with what's wrong with peer review. So let me take a step back and, you know, when I teach research methods or even just talking to the public, talking to family, things like that, you know, often people want to know what, when should I trust a research finding? How do I know which findings are solid? And this has been especially important with the amount of science news about the pandemic, for example, but even in our everyday lives, I think people often want to know, should they believe science news or not, or nutrition or health or um, research on well-being, stuff like that. Um, and there's a few different answers we have to this question, but I would argue that none of them is very satisfying. So one answer we sometimes see is this idea of the evidence pyramid with systematic reviews and meta-analyses near the top. But I think the replication crisis in psychology has shown that actually that won't save us when the bottom of that pyramid is not super solid. So when the individual studies that are going into the reviews and meta-analyses are not really solid, then you get a lot of biased results out of the systematic reviews and meta-analyses as well. So that's not a great solution. And you could take a longer view and say, okay, but the things that really stand the test of time, the things that make it into textbooks, into the canon, those are the things we can trust. Well, again, I think the replication crisis in psychology and in other fields has shown that even textbook findings might not always be trustworthy. And also this doesn't help with the thousands of research findings that haven't yet been put to that test of long-term um, standing up to time. Another solution would be to only trust those things that have made it to the very, very top, like you know, won awards or prizes. Again, that doesn't help us with the vast majority of findings we need to sift through. So what ends up happening a lot is that at least researchers, but to some extent, even people outside of the scientific community, end up relying on journal prestige or impact factor and trusting research if it's published in a you know high quality a journal with reputation for, for being selective or publishing high quality work. 
But of course, the problem is that these journals have a lot of different incentives, not just publishing the highest quality work. They might be motivated by their financial bottom line. They may be motivated by driving up their impact factor and the amount of newsworthy stuff that they publish, um, publishing really kind of shocking, transformative stuff, but that's by nature more risky. And as readers, we're left not knowing why a paper was accepted by one of these very selective journals. So sure, we know it was in the top 2% or whatever that by that journal standards, but we don't know if that's because it was a really definitive paper or a really groundbreaking, big if true kind of paper. Um, so even then, we're, we're really in the dark about what's good or bad about that paper unless we're, have, we happen to be qualified to evaluate that specific paper. So there's been a push lately from several different corners of the scientific community to try to get uh, people to abandon journal name as a heuristic for the quality of an individual paper. And so one example of that is the San Francisco Declaration on Research Assessment or DORA. Um, and there's several others as the Hong Kong Principles and uh, Leiden Manifesto. And just for DORA, um, there's many um, organizations and individuals, thousands of individuals that have signed it and quite a few organizations. Here's a few in Europe and then a few that you might've heard of outside. Um, of Europe, so including my own university. So my own university signed DORA very recently. So far that hasn't led to any noticeable action, but maybe this will take some time. But the core tenets of DORA are captured in this tweet. And I wanna emphasize one of them, the middle one, which is the need to assess research on its own merits. So not use journal impact factor or journal level heuristics when assessing research or researchers. So if we wanna know if a specific paper or finding or a researcher does solid research, um, we shouldn't be basing that on what journals they publish the work in. So that sounds really good. And I definitely agree with this principle that we should assess research on its own merits. But what does that mean in practice? How do we actually do that? Now, one tempting argument and one that works in many contexts is to say, well, you should just read the full manuscript. And surely that works when we're talking about evaluating a small number of papers or a small number of researchers um, who are within our own area of expertise. But I would argue that that's not feasible in many, many contexts. So it's not feasible when we need to do it at scale. So we have maybe 100 or 200 job applicants that we need to evaluate their work or applicants for grants or awards, same thing. Or when we're rushed, we don't have time to read the papers carefully. We need to know a heuristic or anytime we're outside our area of expertise. So that means for non-scientists trying to evaluate science, but even for scientists trying to evaluate you know, science in other disciplines, or I would argue even sometimes in our own or neighboring disciplines, you know, I think we've all been in the position of trying to understand a paper in a slightly different discipline and not knowing the methods well enough to be able to tell and just kind of wishing that we knew what the experts who are really familiar with those methods would say. And even if it's exactly in my area of expertise, I'm just one person. So as we all know, as you know, people who study assessment, the judgment of one judge is not necessarily the best way to assess a quality, like the quality of the research. Um, so even as someone, even if I was reading a paper in my own subfield, I would benefit from knowing what other people with, with the same amount of expertise think of the paper. So really saying that the best way to assess research is just for each person to make up their own mind based on their own reading of the paper doesn't seem like an optimal way. And it doesn't work for many, many contexts where the evaluations really matter. Decision makers and public policy, science journalists, um, everyday people you know, trying to make decisions in their lives. Um, so what I would argue is that if we want people to evaluate research on its own merits, if we want our colleagues when they're making hiring decisions or the deans of our universities or people making decisions about grants or awards or the public when evaluating what to believe, if we want them to evaluate the research on its own merits, if people easily decision because they recruit the best experts, which I think asks, like raises the question. So if we put our assessment expert hats on and ask ourselves, if journal peer review was an operationalization of the construct research quality, would we say that it's a good operationalization? Is journal peer review a good measure of research quality? And I think it would fail some of the most basic tests. So for example, most journals don't define 
what they mean by quality. What are they looking for? What qualities do they want reviewers and editors to emphasize? What are the basis, bases for their decisions? And then the evaluations are kept hidden, so we don't see what the reviewers say. The editor sees it, but everyone else loses that information. And all of that is reduced just to a binary decision. So we don't know if a paper is accepted. We don't know if it was accepted because the reviewers thought it was very exciting or very incremental but solid or had a lot of applied value or had a lot of theoretical value. All of that information about which aspects the, re the reviewers and editor thought were good is lost. And because that information isn't visible to readers, that means there's no accountability, no way to validate the process. So we're supposed to trust that journals have some kind of definition of quality, implement that definition really well through peer review, and make decisions that are really have, are well calibrated to the actual qualities that they're concerned about, want to pick out. So this, this kind of cynical, maybe, or critical view of peer review um, has come from a lot of my own experiences as a journal editor and seeing how things work and how kind of haphazard the whole process can often be, how much room there is for unfairness or just randomness in the decisions. And I think it, it, seeing that and talking to people outside of the scientific community and realizing what they think peer review does, that they think it's this kind of quality control that if it passes, it's above so, some threshold of quality, led me to the conclusion that I think peer reviewed journals really don't do what most people assume they do and what science kind of needs a mechanism to do, which is to sort out high quality research from low quality. But really we all know that quality isn't just a single dimension. So I would argue what we really need is to, to get more information about why it passed peer review at that journal. What were the dimensions on which it was rated highly? Were there any dimensions on which it was rated low quality? So, because of all this, readers don't know what's good about the research, right? They just know it made it into this journal. Um, and we can't even be sure that peer review really picks out good research. We just assume it does. We assume that highly selective journals are picking out the better papers, um, but we can't evaluate that process. We can't assess the validity of their measure of research quality. So if we ask ourselves, maybe this idea that the, the public has of what peer review ought to do is a good one, and we should try to strive for it. And if we reinvented peer review now, what would we imagine that peer review ought to do? I think one thing it ought to do is assess multiple dimensions of quality. So explicitly define what qualities it cares about and maximizing and choosing the papers based on and have reviewers give quantitative ratings on continuous dimensions on those, on those qualities. In addition to open-ended reviews, I think narrative reviews are also valuable, um, but why not? also get quantitative ratings on the dimensions that we think are important, and then transparently report those evaluations so that anybody can see what are the strengths, what are the weaknesses according to the experts most familiar with that area. And then there's no reason that should be static, right? We, can't, we don't need to stop evaluating a paper once it's accepted by a journal, so those ratings should be allowed to be updated over time. If we find a problem with a particular method that we didn't realize at the time, we can go back and update our ratings of, of papers that use that method. So what I'm going to argue is that peer review should produce some updating scores that I'm going to call quality factors for each paper so that we get all of the information that, that rich information that reviewers have, we turn it into a quantifiable, aggregatable measure that other people can benefit from as well. So this would change the incentive structure for authors. Instead of trying to get it accepted by the most prestigious journal possible, they would their motivation for their paper would be to get it right so that they score highly on the dimensions that they care about. They can be proud of the paper they put out. If it has weaknesses, they're acknowledged in the paper. They, they, what's in the paper matches the expert's evaluations. This would also give readers a better way to evaluate research quality than relying on journal prestige. So this would take a lot of the kind of power and monopoly that journals, often for-profit journals currently have. We rely on them to tell us what's good research and what's bad. We outsource that to them. It's a black box right now. We can't really evaluate if they're doing what we're paying them millions and millions and millions of dollars to do. Um, and we can take that power back and redefine what we mean by quality ourselves. So this is something that I've been thinking about for a long time. Um, I actually went back in my emails and searched for when I first um, started communicating with people about this idea of rating the quality of journal articles. And actually it started out as a journal level idea that I thought there should be just like those journal impact factors, there should be journal 
metrics of the quality of the research they tend to publish. And I got this idea when I was reading a blog post back in 2012. Um, it was a blog, blog post by Brent Donnellan. And in that blog post, Chris Fraley had written a comment in the comments section saying there should be like a consumer reports for journals. Like right now, all we have is journal impact factors or like loose reputational measures. But why not like audit the quality of their products and rate them on the average quality or the typical quality of the papers they publish? And so I wrote to him and said, oh, that's a great idea. We should do that. <laughs> and so this is something I've been thinking about for about nine years. And then my favorite part of this email is it wouldn't be hard to do, right? And here I am nine years later, still beginning, still in the early stages of trying to work this out. Although now what I'm talking about now is more of a paper level metric rather than a journal level metric, but you could imagine aggregating it into um, journal level metrics as well for those who are interested in, in the, the qualities of different journals. So who would use these metrics, these paper level quantitative ratings on different dimensions? Well, interested members of the public, so we all probably have some family members who wanna know, like, should I believe this latest science saying that people who wear blue are not trustworthy or whatever? Um, it'd be useful to them to know what do the experts think. Um, science journalists, of course, I mean, this is basically what they try to recreate when they call other experts and ask them what they think of a paper they're thinking of reporting on. Policymakers, again, they don't have the expertise themselves to evaluate the quality of the paper, but it really matters to them. What are the dimensions on which the paper is good? Is it application ready? Maybe they don't care about theoretical value or other things, but they want to know is the applied, are the applied claims warranted and sound? But within science, committees reviewing many different candidates who have you know, too much to be able to read each paper independently, scientists in neighboring disciplines, and as I mentioned, even scientists in the same discipline could benefit from uh, the perspective of people with complementary expertise. Um, and even when it's exactly in our own discipline, exactly, you know, our, our close colleagues work, we could benefit from knowing what other people think too, right? Aggregating across multiple experts. So despite my kind of cynicism about journal-based peer review, I want to argue that what reviewers are doing, what we're all doing when we evaluate each other's work is really valuable information. We're producing new knowledge. It's something that's very, very hard to create in any other way. There's no other measure, in my opinion, that's as good for measuring the quality of a paper as the aggregated judgments of experts who have read the paper closely, who know those methods, know those theories really well. So that information is so valuable. And I would argue that we're wasting a lot of it, or in some cases it's being exploited for profit. And we should kind of take back control of that information, quantify it and share it transparently. And not only would that be immediately valuable to others, but it would also mean that we could improve the measure. We could validate whether these quality ratings um, predict outcomes or agree with each other, et cetera, and try to improve our measure of how we do peer review which dimensions we assess, how we assess them, and so on. Okay, so to do that, we need to ask ourselves, what are the dimensions of quality? What makes a paper good? And this is gonna vary a bit field by field. So I'm gonna get into the weeds now of the dimensions I've thought of for personality research in particular. And one thing I'd be curious to hear is if this sounds reasonable to you, if there are other dimensions that you would nominate or ones that you would cut that you don't think are measures of quality and so on. So let me tell you a little bit about how I went about kind of brainstorming these potential dimensions. So I looked at things like, what do we teach our students about what makes research good? What is high quality research? Well, in research methods, undergraduate, graduate courses, we teach about you know, different dimensions that make research good. We could look at our stated scientific values. What do we tell the public about what makes science special? What makes it different from other ways of knowing? Um, and we can look at what society expects of us. What do they think scientists value? What do they think it means for when scientists do quality control? What are we weeding out? What are we selecting, et cetera? Um, and I'll admit that a lot of also my brainstorming about this came from just my own experience as an editor and reviewer and author, You know, what kinds of things get raised in peer review and which things do I think ought to be raised and emphasized more in peer review, which things do I think are not as important? So this is kind of, I'm not, yeah, it'll be interesting to see how much this is my own personal kind of subjective preference of what should be considered quality dimensions. And even among the ones I'm going to talk about, there's some that I care about a lot more 
than others. But one of the nice things about this kind of approach is that you can include a lot of different dimensions and um, different people can weigh them however they want. So I can include dimensions that I'm personally gonna weigh almost zero, but I think they should be in there in case other people for other purposes care about those dimensions. Okay, so let me talk through what those dimensions might be. So to do that, I'm gonna talk about the structure of a typical paper. So we have the research question that's quite broad. From that, we might have a few different studies, each with multiple different measures and manipulations and outcomes and so on. Then we have a lot of different analyses to test, to uh, combine those, those measures and looks at their association, et cetera. And then we, we, those analyses are kind of reduced into a few claims or interpretations, and then we have conclusions. So when we think about what makes a paper good, there might be things all along that um, continuum. So um, I'm gonna go through the ones I've come up with so far. So the first characteristic that I think is part of what makes a paper high quality is stuff related to transparency and comprehensibility. Now I wanna emphasize, I don't think that a paper that's very transparent is necessarily good. But I think quality, uh, sorry, transparency is a necessary factor to be able to even evaluate quality. So if there's not transparency, it's very hard to evaluate the quality of a paper. So I think we should be skeptical of its quality of, of how much we can trust the claims. So I'm putting transparency and comprehensibility in here, but I do recognize that it's it has a kind of unique relationship to quality where it's not, transparency just makes it possible to evaluate quality. So for transparency, what do I mean? Well, is the rationale and the structure of the argument clear? Are the methods and materials described in enough detail that I really understand what was done? I could, I could run the same study myself if I wanted to. Is the timing of the decisions transparent? Can I tell whether the analyses were chosen before or after the researchers had seen the data, if there's any data dependence? Um, and are the data and code um, transparent enough that I can reanalyze them if that's ethically possible and so on. Okay, so those are some of the things that I might that might go into transparency and comprehensibility. Then the next kind of core set of factors are things related to validity. And here I'm including both the strength of the methods and the calibration of the conclusions to the evidence. So here we're focusing really on kind of the methods and results of the paper. And for the strengths of the methods, I like to conceptualize it in terms of the four validities. So construct validity are the measures and manipulations, measuring and manipulating the constructs they're meant to. Internal validity, if there are any causal claims, are they well justified and warranted? Statistical conclusion validity, are there relatively few errors? Are the, is, are the um, inference, statistical inferences sound, models sound, et cetera? And external validity, are the generalizations well founded? Um, and then I would say that a lot of what the focus has been on in the kind of reform movement and replication crisis in psychology has focused on specific, a specific part of validity within statistical conclusion validity. So within statistical conclusion validity, th there's things like internal consistency, but the stuff that we focused a lot on are things like replicability, reproducibility, robustness. Um, so these have to do with rates of type one error, type two error, um, the, uh, the kinds of un unforced errors that you might get from typos, things like that, code not being clear. Um, a lot of that impinges on the validity of the statistics and statistical conclusions. So those would all be things you could imagine having a lot of different factors within validity. There's a lot you could break up. This is obviously these four validities is just one model of how you can break up validity. Other people have different models. Um, but there's a lot that goes in, that gets packed into this validity box. And then the other half of it, the calibration of conclusions, also within the validity box, is basically asking, do the broad claims match the evidence? So is there a good match from the research question to the actual studies? You know, we've all read papers where the introduction makes us really excited about what the studies are gonna look like, and then the studies are a very impoverished version of what we were led to imagine in the introduction. Um, or, and is, are the conclusions a good match to what the evidence actually showed in the studies? So that those both, relate to the calibration of the claims and the match between the abstract claims and the actual empirical work. Okay, so I call these credibility signals. So they have to do with the basic credibility of the work. So work that is more transparent can earn more credibility because it's subjecting itself to more scrutiny. So if there are errors, they're more likely to get caught. And then work that's more valid, if you can examine it, if it's transparent enough to scrutinize it, then if it stands up to that scrutiny, the measures are valid, the, the claims are, are valid and well substantiated and so on, then it has more credibility. 
I would also add that prior plausibility factors into credibility too, but it's not itself a quality signal, right? You can do high quality research on, to, on claims that have very low priors, but as a reader, I might be more skeptical of those claims, not because the, the work isn't as high quality. But so that belongs somewhere in there in our assessment of how much should you believe this result, but not necessarily in our assessment of the quality of the work. Okay, so then there's a whole nother set of qualities that I call substantial contributions. Um, so these include like the contribution to theory or what, what is the value of the ideas and the theory in the, in the work or the theoretical implications? What is the applied value of the work? Um, is there any development of new methods or tools that's valuable? Or maybe sometimes the raw data set itself is a huge contribution. And so these all kind of get at the importance of the work. There's a lot of different ways that research could be important that I think is, is important to capture and is a big focus of a lot of peer review already. So I thought it would be important to put it in here. Um, and then I have a couple other general qualities that I didn't know exactly where to fit in. So they're floating around. So one is intellectual humility. Some of this is captured in calibrated conclusions, but I would argue there's other aspects to a paper that make it intellectually humble. So like the fairness of the lit review, how balanced it is and whether there are references to things that wouldn't fit in well with the author's own preferred theory, for example, things like that. Um, and then ethical soundness, which hopefully because we all run our studies through ethics committees and have other ways of kind of monitoring ourselves and each other, you would hope that there's not very many studies in the published literature that would get flagged on this. But in our project, reading a lot of papers, we do come across some that I think it's important to point out in our evaluation of the quality of the work that there were some ethical questions either in the way that data were collected or in the conclusions drawn from the data. So this is my kind of list of what I think some of the qualities could be that we should be assessing when evaluating the quality of work in personality psychology. So I'm looking at the time and I'm gonna to have to rush through this next part, which is talking about some of the studies we've done or are doing evaluating quality. So I'm gonna skip a few of them, but I'll talk about some of the highlights. And just to give you an idea, we're taking two different approaches to evaluating the quality of research papers. Um, one is to, to take a more objective, I'm going to say put objective in quotes, approach to coding characteristics of papers. So like coding things like sample size, I'll give you some more examples, um, which has some advantages. So it feels more objective. It's arguably less susceptible to biases and heuristics. And for some variables, it can be done at scale. It can be automated or done at least very quickly by humans, by humans who don't necessarily need a ton of expertise. Disadvantages is that it's not always nearly as objective as it seems, and sometimes it can be just as tedious or more tedious as getting an expert to make a subjective, holistic evaluation of a paper. And it can be really far from the construct we're interested in. So if what I'm interested in is how good is the design and all I can measure objectively is sample size, that's a really, really narrow way of operationalizing the quality of the design. So the second approach is a more subjective approach, which is where we ask experts to read papers or read parts of papers and rate them on some qualities that we've identified. We enumerate the qualities and ask them to do ratings. It's closer to the contract, constructs of interest. Um, this gives us ability to have scores on the dimensions we care about, which can be weighted in different ways to create metrics. They can be modular, so reviewers can still rate just one dimension. So it has some of the benefits of the more objective approach where if someone's expertise really is in evaluating the statistical validity of the paper, they can focus on that. Someone else could focus on the theoretical soundness, et cetera. Um, but it's arguably more susceptible to biases and heuristics. Um, it feels less objective um, and it's yeah less concrete, right? It's on arbitrary metrics, et cetera. So, it has a little bit of the fuzziness associated with, with um, subjective ratings. Um, and I think many of us have experience in other domains comparing quote unquote objective measures to more subjective measures. For example, I have some work on non-human animal personality comparing like behavior counts to ratings by humans who know the individuals really well. And what we found is when you're looking for stable individual differences, the subjective ratings do much, much better. It's just so hard to count behavior well enough and over a long enough period of time to get reliable, good measures of what an individual is typically like. We see this with humans too. And so if you can get raters who know the person well, the animal well, to give more holistic ratings, even though that feels less objective, it actually predicts outcomes better. 
it's more reliable and the signs point to it being more valid. So I think the same might be true here, that it feels more like scientific to code objective characteristics, but I really think there's no substitute for expert human judgments of the, the overall quality of the paper. But I'll talk about one project we did that's on the more objective side and one project on the more subjective side. Um, okay, so I'm gonna skip a bunch of other projects that are not necessarily from my lab that have focused on the more objective aspects of, of papers. So this is one, was one of ours, but I'm gonna talk about one that we're in the middle of, which we call the roller coaster project, where we're trying to code many different characteristics of papers. This is led by my graduate student, Sarah Schiavoni. And in this project, we're coding papers published in social and personality psychology between 2010 and 2020. So we're part of the goal is to look at trends over time, um, including these journals, um, as well as papers published in the SciArchive preprint server during this period. And so what we're coding, we have three different categories of coders. So one is our undergraduate research assistants who have training, they've taken research methods and often statistics and psychology. They've worked in our lab for a while, you know, we've trained them for weeks or months and they code things like sample size, what type of participant is it? Is it students? Is it adults? Is it children? Is it a special population? Is it a hard to reach population? And then some more subjective things like how bold are the claims in the abstract? Um, were there causal claims? We have some RAs, research assistants, looking up things like the, uh, the PhD year of the first author, other characteristics of the authors and institutions. I put an asterisk next to causal claims because we actually have found so far that we're not able to train undergraduate, even advanced undergraduates, to identify causal claims versus association claims, even when we include some kind of middle categories. Um, it turns out to be really, really hard. Um, it's something we're struggling with. We have another category of things that only we, the graduate students, postdocs, and faculty in the lab code. So we spend several hours every week on Zoom coding articles in silence together using a Shiny app that Sarah has made. So we code things like, is there a sample size justification? Is there a power analysis or discussion of precision? Is it an experimental or observational design within or between subjects? Which methods were used? Self-reports, peer reports, physiology, et cetera. Um, how intensive were the methods? This is a more subjective rating. And then we're coding which kinds of limitations are mentioned. And we have a subgroup of people um, p-curving a subset of the papers. So p-curve is where you identify the key p-value for the key statistical test for each study, and then look at the shape of that distribution of the significant p-values. It's extremely time intensive. So we're doing that for a smaller subset of papers. And then we have some things that we're trying to automate. Um, and so uh, we're working on validating some of our algorithms to see whether or not we can automate the coding of these things. So some of these we're also having humans code to compare the, the algorithm to the humans. Um, and so these are some of the variables so far that we've, we think we can automate. Um, so we're kind of taking what I call a kitchen sink approach, where we're trying to think what are all the things we can measure with the resources we have, the expertise we have, the number of people we have, and the algorithms we can think of. Um, and so some of our research questions include how have researchers, research practices changed over time? We think that this period of 2010 to 2020 might be one of rapid changes in social and personality psychology. We also wanna know how well calibrated our authors' claims about their studies. So is it the case that bold, strong claims go with really strong, clear evidence, or is there a lack of calibration between the strength of the claims and the kind of quality of the design and, and strength of the evidence? Um, and then how do these things vary according to characteristics of the authors? So their prestige, their age index, their career stage, things like that. And how do they vary according to characteristics of the journals? So we have a range of journals in terms of their prestige and impact factor, their principles and values, whether they're open access or not, things like that. Okay, so that's the, the first approach of coding objective things. And then we have a few projects where we have more subjective ratings. So I'm gonna race through these again, I apologize for the speed. But one is a pilot study linked to the roller coaster study. So for a small subset, of the papers that we have detailed objective codings of, we also recruited some experts to read the entire paper. Um, and we used papers from either 2010 or 2019. And we paid reviewers who are people who would be reviewers of actual social and personality papers, so trained researchers in this area. Um, and they read the papers and rated them on various qualities. So it took about 30 to 60 minutes per paper. We picked papers from journals that publish short reports to make it 
a little bit more manageable. So the ratings looked like this. So evaluate construct validity, evaluate statistical validity, and each of those linked to a kind of brief definition if they weren't familiar with that wording or that phrase. Um, but also, you know, questions about clarity, the methods are well aligned with the question, abstracts are well aligned with the finding, research is transparently reported, et cetera. We had an overall, this paper is high quality. We had an open-ended text box about what are some of the major problems. And we had also had them rate characteristics of the intro and the discussion. Um, and then overall, like how important, creative, interesting, novel, et cetera, is the paper. So trying to get at many of the different qualities that I mentioned earlier. So we haven't analyzed these data yet. So this is one thing we'll be able to look at these papers um, with as, together with the objectively coded characteristics of the papers. I think we have about two or 300 papers that were um, rated by two raters for this project. I'm going to skip this one. Um, this is another study that my lab took part in. It was really driven by Courtney Soderberg and her colleagues at the Center for Open Science. We played a small role in it, but it's a really nice demonstration of a combination of the objective coding and subjective rating approach. So in this study, um, they recruited 353 reviewers, again, people who actually review for psychology papers, and they assigned the reviewers to read two papers. One was a registered report that was actually published um, after going through the registered report format, which is where the um, journal evaluates the paper before the data are collected and gives an in-principle acceptance and commits to publishing the paper regardless of the outcome, and the authors commit to following the plan regardless of whether it produces significant results or not. And one, a matched paper that was either matched because it was by the same authors or it was published in the same journal around the same time. And the reviewers were blind to whether the paper they were reading was a registered report or not. So the, the researchers, the team we were collaborating with, removed any identifying information from the paper that would identify it as a registered report. So the reviewers rated the papers on methodology and outcome on dimensions similar to some of the ones that I've been talking about. And then our team came in and coded objective characteristics of the paper because it's similar to what we've been doing in the roller coaster project. So I'm going to skip to the results and show you the differences between how the registered reports were rated. So the papers where the process of peer review was completely independent of the outcome of the study, whether it was a significant finding or not. Um, and so not surprisingly, often those papers were rated as having more rigorous methods. Um, and you can see that whether the evaluation was done before knowing the study outcome on the part of the reviewers or after. But what's interesting is that even on, on questions having to do with novelty and creativity, the registered reports are not doing worse. So anything to the right of the dashed line is a higher score for registered reports than the, compare, the control group, the matched controls. Um, and so here are the overall evaluations of the overall quality of the paper, the importance of the discoveries, um, whether it'll inspire new research, et cetera. And on all the dimensions, the registered reports were either rated more positively or the same. Um, and then this is the, what we found when we coded objective characteristics of the papers. So the first data column is the registered reports. The other two are the matched controls. And so you can see that registered reports tend to have more open materials, open data and pre-registration than the control papers. But they also tend to have, um, for example, fewer st studies with difficult to reach populations. So the third to last row, only one out of 28 registered reports were coded as, as studying a hard to reach population, whereas more, I mean, these ends are quite small, so we don't wanna infer too much, but there might be some ways in which the registered reports are have some less desirable characteristics. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk about um, my vision for the future. Um, and a, a project that I've proposed, I'm waiting on a grant application. I hope to be able to pursue it even if I probably don't get the grant. Um, and this is really building on this idea of these quality factors and trying to get uptake on getting a large sample of papers in the psychology literature rated on something like these dimensions. So my idea would be to develop a scale and validate it um, that captures these dimensions relatively explicitly on a quantitative measure. So here was an early draft of the scale. Um, I think it needs to be unfortunately longer than this, which I'm really not happy about because I want it to be really usable. But here I've crammed like all the substantial contribution things like theoretically innovating or innovative or has applied value, etc. That's all into one item. So I think this that needs to be split up a bit more. Maybe some other things could be condensed. Um, but this is my attempt to try to get 
you know, clear, simple items that get at some of these dimensions that could be weighted on a Likert type scale. So my plan is to try to get uptake of this measure in a few different ways. So one is there's a really nice example of a field that already does something kind of like this, and that's biology. They have a website, there's a group called prereview.org, which is overlaid on top of their preprint server bioarchive. Um, and it's a site for crowdsourcing preprint reviews. And they, they can be adapted, the reviews can use different rubrics. So there are rubrics available, some of which include quantitative ratings on dimensions. Um, and so it, it has the flexibility to allow for different rubrics for different types of research or different subfields. Um, and I could I would imagine doing a similar thing for SciArchive, for example, developing an overlay platform on top of SciArchive where people can make, can evaluate papers independent of any journal, right? Just as independent reviewers, and can do so using a rubric that fits the type of paper that they're evaluating. And Preview has also had a lot of success in creating a community. So they provide reviewer training, they match people with mentors, they have journal clubs where you practice reviewing papers together, you can earn reputational credit as a reviewer. I think all of that is really important for making this popular, making it a viable alternative, or not necessarily alternative to journal-based peer review, but to get it to get traction maybe in parallel with journal-based peer review. Another appealing feature of this is that it's way more flexible. So you could imagine making it really modular where people can go in and just rate one dimension that they're really good at evaluating, where they have the expertise or the time or the resources to evaluate just that one dimension. One kind of extreme example of this is the Twitter account just says in mice that it's, it's basically a very narrow form of peer review. So it tweets headlines or paper titles that are misleading because they imply that the finding was found in humans when in fact it was found in mice and it just writes in mice at the top of the tweet. Um, so you could imagine a reviewer going in and just, for example, looking for all the cases where a particular error in mediation analysis is made or a common problem with SEM or, or some theory is misrepresented or something like that. And another really important step, I think, to making this attraction would be to put money in it. So to pay reviewers, there's a couple of different models for doing that. Red team market is a new thing where people can sign up to be paid to, to critique other people's work and then authors can pay critics to evaluate their work. There's the 450 movement to try to pay reviewers. Um, and then replicates, which I'm a part of, is also a funded thing where they pay people, give people grants to evaluate papers in a systematic way. Um, so I'm hoping that we can get grant funding to get something like this off the ground. And another alternative is to lobby journals to adopt this kind of rubric, this quantitative rating system in their own peer review and to share the ratings publicly, at least for the papers that they publish, that they accept and publish. Let us know what the reviewers thought on these different dimensions. Um, there's also questions about how we can make sure that the system isn't worse than the traditional peer review system. So what about corruption? What about unprofessional behavior, et cetera? And here again, I think peerreview.org has really good um, ways to try to manage that. So all users are required to have accounts linked to their ORCID, so that means they have to be in the scientific community to have an ORCID, but you're allowed to use a pseudonym, so you don't have to reveal your identity to the world, but the moderators of the platform know who you are, you agree to a code of conduct, and if you don't follow it, if you violate the rules, you can get kicked out. Somebody, the moderators know who you are, so there's oversight and moderation that way. And there's also oversight of things like reviewer rings or conflicts of interest by having that kind of um, structure. So I don't think we can get away from some kind of gatekeeping and moderation, but I think it can be much more productive than the current system. So I will stop there and end on this kind of summary of what I would like to um, achieve. And I will stop here and see what people have to say. Thank you very much, Simin. Um, we have uh, we have some time for questions, so we are open to all of your comments, uh, suggestions, whatever you feel like. I don't know if there if there are questions in the room. Oh, I see someone has their hand up, Gregor. Oh uh, yeah. Exactly. 
Gregor. Yeah. Hello. Um, yeah, uh, thanks for the lecture. I think it's a really important um, uh, problem that uh, you are uh, starting to, to, to deal with. Um, I, um, uh, I have well, two potential concerns about, um, uh, about you you've talked about. Uh, first is, uh, the first is um, related to the replication papers. Uh, 